Hello, and welcome to worship. Today we are in the last week of the, the final season of the church year, the season of the end times. And we conclude with the Christ the King Festival. And so on this day we rejoice in the victory that Christ our King has won for us, an eternal victory over sin and death. And on this day we find comfort in knowing that Christ our King, he, he rules from his throne in perfect control of all things, ruling for our good. And today we are encouraged to tell others about Christ their King, so that through the gospel he may reign and rule in the hearts of many more. If you'd like to follow along with the order of service, uh, you can find a link to a worship folder in the video description just below this video. God bless your worship. We'll begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We have come to worship our King. But if, we, but if we examine our life and our human nature, we find ourselves unworthy to stand in his presence. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ, our King, has won your forgiveness through his perfect life, innocent death, and glorious resurrection. In his stead and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue with our scripture lessons. In our Old Testament lesson, the Lord gives his prophet Daniel a vision of the, the reign and kingdom of Christ our King. We'll read from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson from the book of Revelation assures us that our King is coming in glory and in power. We'll read from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of our Lord. Our gospel lesson shows us the kind of king of love that we have in Jesus. A king who willingly humbled himself to save us, his people. We'll read from John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. And the gospel lesson will serve as the basis for the sermon message. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, every once in a while you see something cool and you wish that you had thought of it first. Well, I had such an experience just this, this past week when I stumbled upon a YouTube channel. And on this YouTube channel, it, it, it showed videos that this creator made of just recording himself doing everyday, common, ordinary tasks. But in these videos on this, this channel, he, he would show these common, ordinary tasks, but he would play them in reverse. So, for example, he would record himself peeling the skin off of an apple. But then he would play that video in reverse, and so it would look like, with a knife, he was putting the skin back on the apple. Or he had a video of him squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. But again, on, the, on his channel, he would show that same video, but, but in reverse. And, and I'm jealous of this idea, be, not because I thought the videos were so entertaining and enthralling, but because I think he was making quite the profit off of these videos, and it is such an incredibly simple idea. This one video alone that I watched, it had over a million views. And again, he has a whole channel just dedicated to videos just like this. Apparently, there is a sizable market out there of people who are craving this backwards video content. Well, backwards is what I thought of when I first read through the words of our gospel lesson earlier this week. It shows us this scene that seems so incredibly and entirely backwards. The judge over all, over the living and the dead, is himself standing trial. The king of kings, the king over all the earth, is being interrogated by and at the mercy of this puny governor over this small Roman province. The long-awaited Messiah, the promised Messiah who God's people had been waiting for and longing for for thousands of years. He's there. He's on the scene. And yet the people who should have been the very first ones to recognize him and herald his coming are instead shouting for his death. And in this seemingly foolish and backward scene, however, is the wisdom of God. In this upside-down scene, the plan of God for our salvation is being carried out. You know, Jesus says our king, he does not do as we expect. He is not treated as we expect. His kingdom does not operate as we might expect. But he is exactly the king that we need. It was Good Friday morning. And all through the previous night, well, it began on Thursday night, of course. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And all through that night, then, Jesus was being brought before different courts and rulers. And Jesus was spending time before mostly the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling body and the high priest. And these were people who were desperate for any excuse to have Jesus executed. And finally, the charge that they settled on, the charge that they were going to bring against him, was that he was guilty of blasphemy, that Jesus claimed to be God, 
And the punishment they determined was going to be death. But there was a major problem. And that is that they didn't really have the authority to carry out that sentence. That in order to execute someone, they would need the authority, the backing of Rome. Which then led to another problem. And that is that Rome didn't really care much about this charge of blasphemy. Right, Pilate, who was the appointed Roman governor over the province of, of Palestine, he had no interest in getting involved in what he saw to be their religious squabbles. And so they focused their accusations then on Jesus' claims to be a king. Now, if Jesus was claiming to be king, that would, in fact, be a threat to Rome. That would be something that Rome would be interested in. And so Pilate, he does his due diligence, and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, we don't know how Pilate asked this question. But I think it's easy for us to imagine Pilate asking this question with just a touch of sarcasm. Are you, of all people, really a king? Right? Is this the supposed threat to Caesar standing in front of me? Is this what I am to be concerned about? You know, regardless of how Jesus answered this question, I don't imagine that Pilate was tempted to bow down in front of this bloodied and beaten and friendless and powerless man in front of him. Pilate may have been thinking, this is a joke. Just what kind of power and authority is this Jesus supposed to have? The world still doesn't recognize or really see the power and authority of Jesus today, does it? The world is still challenging Jesus' authority. The world challenges Jesus' authority when it comes to moral matters. You know, many people might say, yeah, Jesus, he's a good teacher. He teaches us some pretty great things and, you know, about loving your neighbor and stuff like that. But, but let's be real here. Jesus, he, he lived 2,000 years ago. Can he really be the final authority on what is right and what is wrong today? Well, might we challenge Jesus' moral authority when it stands in the way of, you know, the wrong that we want to do or, or tells us the good things that we want to avoid doing? And we might challenge Jesus' authority when it comes to his ruling and reigning here in this world. You know, you've probably heard and, and maybe even thought yourself this kind of classic attack that is used to challenge God's authority. It goes something like this. If God is really in control, if he really has power and authority and control over this world, well, then why are there so many bad things that are happening? Why are there so many bad things that are happening out in the world and, and in my own life personally? We challenge God's authority and think that we should be able to tell him how he ought to be ruling and reigning over things. Or maybe we challenge Jesus' authority by trying to make him into this, this part-time king. A kind of a king that just kind of gets involved whenever we summon him or beckon him. I think, yeah, Jesus, I, I'll call you when I want you. I'll, I'll call you when I need you. All right, then I'll come to church. Then, then, then I'll come to you in prayer. But otherwise, Jesus, don't think you have the authority, the jurisdiction over my life to be able to tell me what to do and to call me to repentance. Now, I don't think any of us would be so brazen to say that outright. But just in the way that we live our, our daily lives, and in our prayer life, in our worship life, are, are we reflecting that attitude? Well, Jesus responds to Pilate's questioning. He tells him, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. But Jesus makes clear to Pilate that, that his kingdom is not a threat to, to Caesar's kingdom or any secular kingdom for that matter. Because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. If Jesus' kingdom were of this world, well then Jesus would not be standing there in Pilate's piddly courtroom. But Jesus says, if my kingdom were of this world, well then my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But in fact, at his arrest, remember what Jesus told his disciples, he told him to stand down. He said, put your swords away. 
But Jesus didn't really need his disciples either, did he? Jesus could have called upon armies and legions of angels, and they would have been there in an instant to perfectly defend him and protect him. And if Jesus' kingdom were of this world, well, then he he certainly would have done that. But Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And so it doesn't operate as we might expect it to operate. Let's not make the mistake of mistaking this for weakness. See, Jesus' life, it was not in the hands of Pilate and those soldiers as they supposed it was. If our Christ, our King, if, if he was going to stand trial and be executed, it was only going to be because he allowed it and even willed it. If Jesus was going to be led up Golgotha with a cross, it's only going to be because he allows it and even wills it. Right? None of this would be forced upon our King. And you know the story. But that's exactly what happened. He was led up that he was led up Golgotha with that cross. He was executed. And why? Well, it's because his kingdom is not of this world. And in the kingdom of our Christ, the victory is won through the humility of the cross. Did you pick up on something kind of subtle that Jesus said? In his answer to Pilate, he says, but now my kingdom is from another place. Emphasis on now. Now Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Now his kingdom, it is veiled in humility and weakness, but it will not always be that way. When Christ comes again in glory, his kingdom and his power will be visibly and physically seen by all. As our lesson from Revelation tells us, every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. And when Christ comes again in glory, all the kingdoms of this world will be made entirely obsolete. There will be only one kingdom, the eternal kingdom of our God. But for now, now Christ's kingdom is from another place. Pilate says to Jesus, so you are a king then. And Jesus answers, You say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus came into this world for the purpose of testifying to the truth. And it was really testifying to the truth that that put Jesus in this backward scene in the first place. It is because Jesus would not be quiet about the truth that his enemies hated him and wanted him dead. But our king came into this world to testify to the truth, armed with the truth. And that truth is exactly what we need. And we ought to realize that the great weapon that Satan uses against us is his lies. That that the most harm and destruction that Satan causes in this world and in our lives personally all stem from his lies. That every sin and every act of evil can be traced back to a lie coming from the father of lies. And in fact, I think every sinful temptation we could probably trace back to one of the following deceitful phrases from Satan. Satan says, it's not a big deal. No one will ever even know. Or, you'll be much happier if you insert in that blank any sin. He says, forget about others. You've got to take care of yourself. You think you can trust in God to take care of you? I don't think so. And then there is that, that classic lie that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, his tried and proven lie where he says, did God really say? And then there are his lies that maybe we'd say are even more destructive and harmful yet. His lies where he says, don't worry about repentance and forgiveness. You're fine just the way you are. God God is happy with you just the way you are. Don't don't worry about repentance. Don't worry about forgiveness. You don't need those things. Or alternatively, he says, there is no forgiveness for you. You couldn't possibly be forgiven, not because of, of who you are and because of the things that you have done. There is no forgiveness. And with such an enemy, armed with such destructive lies, Well, we can be grateful to know we have a king who comes armed with the truth and testifying to the truth. There's a a pastor 
who reportedly starts every confirmation class, the very first class, he begins in the same way every year. He begins by taking a jar of beans and placing it on the table in front of the class. And then he asks the class to try and and estimate how many beans are in that jar. And then the pastor records their answers on, on a big notepad and writes them down in the list. And after he's done with that list of all their estimates of how many beans are in that jar, he leads them through another list. And this is a list of their favorite songs. And after both lists are complete, the the pastor then tells the class how many beans were in fact in that jar. And they go through the list to see who was the closest to being right. And then the pastor asks, okay, well, who is the closest to being right when it comes to that list of favorite songs? And of course, the students, they all protest and they say, well, there isn't a right answer, right? Your favorite song, that that is a a, a matter of personal feeling. And so the pastor asks then, okay, well, when it comes to what you believe in regards to your faith, is that more like the number of beans in a jar or is it more like choosing your favorite song? And this pastor says that, that overwhelmingly the majority of, of his first-time catechism students, regardless of age, they say that it is more like choosing your favorite song. How could that be? Well, what a shame that is. I, I, what kind of lies and deceit must the devil have sown to bring us to this point that the truth has become some matter of subjective personal feeling? When it comes to our salvation and the salvation of those we love, we need absolute truth, not something like a milk toast selection from a jukebox. We have absolute truth. Our king came into this world to testify to that truth. And the truth is that God loves you with a powerful love. Jesus came to testify to that truth and to be evidence of that truth. God's love for you is so great that that he sent his son down from the comforts of his home in heaven, down into this sinful world, to be rejected and to be betrayed and to suffer and to die in your place. The truth is, is that there is only one way to heaven. And that is Jesus who is the way and the truth and the life. And Jesus, he has made that way. He has cleared the path. He has has opened that door to heaven. And the truth is that contrary to Satan's accusations, there is always forgiveness at the cross. Because in that sacrifice, Christ made perfect payment for all sin. You cannot out-sin God's grace and forgiveness. And the truth is that our king, he is right now reigning on his throne. That that while we get so caught up on on whether the red team or the blue team is winning and in political power and and so concerned about what Russia or China or North Korea are up to, all the while, Christ is reigning from his throne in perfect power and perfect control, and he is ruling and guiding all things for the good of his church, for the good of his people. And the truth is, is that Christ, he is coming again. He is coming for us. Our King is coming and He's coming to gather His bride, the church, to bring us to glory everlasting with Him. This scene that we see in our gospel lesson, again, it is so completely and entirely backwards. But if you know your passion history, well, then you know we're, we're just scratching the surface here on how backwards everything's become. Right, Barabbas, this, this infamous insurrectionist and, and murderer, He's set free. He gets to go home while Jesus is condemned to crucifixion. And and the supposed religious betters of society, the the members of the Sanhedrin, even the high priest, in their pride, they find themselves on the outside of the kingdom of God while this criminal condemned to death on a cross next to Jesus, he has promised the kingdom. It seems so backwards. But as Jesus testified to the truth of his kingdom throughout his ministry, he made clear that this is how things operate in his kingdom. He he said that, that that the exalted, they will be made low, and the lowly will be exalted. He said the first will be last and the last will be first. Everything is topsy turvy and backwards in his kingdom. 
Because Jesus' kingdom, it does not operate like the kingdoms of this world operate. The kingdoms of this world, they operate on the principles of merit and worth. Everything must be earned. But the kingdom of God cannot possibly be earned. It comes only by grace. And through Christ our King, we receive that grace that we need. Through our powerful King who humbled himself, taking on the very nature of a servant, to suffer and die in our place, that we might be made heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not the king that we expect. He is most certainly not the king that we deserve. But he is absolutely the king that we need. May we bring him our worship and praise now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll continue by confessing our faith together. And today we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. And again, you can find a, a copy of this in the worship folder linked to in the video description below. We confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll continue with prayer. You are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you have called us into your kingdom, and have made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. We give thanks to you, O Christ our Shepherd King because you have searched for us and found us. Lead us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, so that we may enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. Heal our hearts when they are broken with sin and guilt, and strengthen us when we are weak. O Christ, our King, we ask that you come with your mighty power to break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil, of the ungodly influences, and the ideas of the world, and of our own sinful nature. Use your power to calm the unrest among nations and peoples, so that your kingdom may spread and grow. Strengthen our confidence in knowing that your kingdom will never be destroyed. And we ask that you hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen. And we'll join together in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.